Welcome to Stay Daily. Casey Porter and Robbie Rainwater here again as we bring you another edition after a successful road weekend in, uh, in the country road, down the country roads in West Virginia. Morgantown, the Cowboys came out a close game Friday. Saturday, Brian Holiday was incredible again. So was Sam Garcia. Sunday went a little bit sideways, fought back, fell on that one though. All in all, two and one on the weekend. It's not exactly what you want especially since you gave up the, the two games at UCF. But, hey, when you go on the road, a good team in West Virginia you win, too, you can't complain. Yeah, and, you know, even going back to the last three series, how close OSU is to sweeping the series and how close they are to getting swept in the series. Yeah, right. You know I mean? And so <laughs> um, it, it, it's it's shaping up to be – you know, the Big 12 that we thought it was going to be, and every do- every game's going to be a dogfight. And, you know, and it, you're, you're one or two outs or one or two pitches away from being 0-3 in the series or 3-0 and in the series. And so um, I think that goes back to what we've talked about a bunch with this pitching staff and that they've, you know, for the most part all year long have kept us in the games and given us the opportunity to win. And, and it's just shaping up to be what we've talked about for the last several weeks of, you know, timely hits and timely hits. Who's going to get the timely hits? And, um, you know, more times than not right now, OSU's getting those. And that's indicative of, you know, winning the last two series. And, um, and that's great for what's coming up this next weekend and, and moving forward. Yeah, and the thing about it is you're able to go on the road and win two out of three, and really one of your big dudes in Carson Binge didn't have one of his best weekends. So I wanted to get to that right off the bat. Yeah. Okay, he got, I think, one, two hits on the weekend, which for him, you know, hey, he's an All-American type player, and he's right. one of the best two-way players in America. So for him, you know, he's used to getting more hits, right? But like the great ones do, Coach, you don't always hit, man. Hitting hitting to get the baseball is a very difficult thing to do. There's always going to be ups and downs. But the great ones find a way to contribute in a very positive way, even when the hits aren't coming like they would like to. And I really felt like Carson Bench did that this weekend. Yeah, I mean, two hits going back to the midweek game against Wichita State. So all week, whether it was the last four games, he's only had two hits. And so, yeah. um, and we've talked about that. This team is going to go offensively as Carson Benz goes. And, and you've seen that this weekend of, you know, he struggled the last four games and and we've struggled to put runs on the board. And um, But like all good teams do, you know, when when, when one of your top hitters um, is struggling, somebody else picks up the slack. And that's what you saw from Zach Earhart this weekend. And so, man, that guy's on fire. But yeah, yeah. Um, it just it's just a testament to Carson Benz of we mention his name every uh, podcast in one form or another about how he contributes every day to the team and, and how much he has put the team on his back for the first part of the um, season. And it's good to see some of the other guys picking up some of that slack when he's struggling. So, um, you know, maybe early on in the season, that wasn't the case. If Carson Benz went over, then we may not have scored a run, you know, or, or we weren't going to win. But we're actually um, in a position now where uh, we've got more than Carson Benz contributing on a consistent basis. And um, we're able to put together, string together enough hits and timely hits to uh, pull out a victory even when he's struggling. Another one, too, Aiden Miola was not available, basically. I know he got the pinch hit, but basically wasn't available all weekend. So when you take away one of your clutch guys from the middle lineup and then Carson Binge didn't have his typical weekend, and you have to go on the road, man, that's just kind of one of those situations to where you just got to get gritty and dig in and find ways to win. You mentioned Zach Earhart, coach. How about all Lamont Matthews all over West Virginia? If you remember Lamont Matthews in that 1999 regional over Oklahoma State, yeah. led by Josh Holiday, the head coach, by the way, went up to Wichita State, and Lamont Matthews went like 99 for 99 against the Shockers, and the Cowboys went yeah. to the College World Series. The only time Tom Holiday led the Cowboys to the World Series as the head coach. Zach had Earhart, coach, 5 for 6 yesterday, 10 for 13 over the weekend, 9 multiple hit multi-hit games in his last 15 played and he's 25 for his last 60 which is 417 i mean 60 at bats is a pretty large sample size to hit 417 over this dude has turned into the zach Earhart we knew he could be yeah and 
you know, it, it come to fruition, what we talked about last podcast, right. Of how intense he is and, and he's going to get the job done. No matter where he's at. It also goes to the testament of what we've talked about all season long and that how this lineup gets shuffled from game to game and guys being in a different role from game to game. Zach Earhart hit lead off in two games and he hit in the four hole in, in another game. You know, I mean, how many times do you see that in division one baseball? How many times do you see that in baseball in general, that you've got a guy that can be anywhere from your lead off to your cleanup hitter in the four hole. And that just speaks to the things the, you know, and like I said, I, I don't know Zach Kerhart personally, but just watching him on the field, I think I made the joke of last week saying that he's the type of guy that orders a water with no ice, you know, yeah, I mean, he just right. intense all the time. And um, a guy that you want in your corner, um, whether it's a baseball game or, or bar fight or whatever the case is, it just seems like he's that kind of guy that you want in your corner and just speaks volumes to the kind of baseball player and his character and his competitiveness and his aggress- aggressiveness on an at-bat to at-bat basis where he can be anywhere from the leadoff to the to the cleanup and, and obviously anything below that also. So, yeah, just incredible to watch him come to play. And I think he was 10 for 13 and – had two intentional walks also, right? Yeah. And he got yeah. intentionally walked two times and yeah. two at two bat two at bats in a row, I believe. So <laughs> yeah, just incredible to watch him. Um, you know, and when like we like we were just talking about, when you see guys like Zach Earhart and and how he just tore it up over the weekend, um, it makes you forget maybe about some of the others that are struggling right now. So uh very That's impressive. That's the way good teams work. Yep, very impressive on his end. So that was fun to watch. Boy, it's been really fun to watch Tyler Wolford. Of course, you got to worry about the hand. It looked like he hurt it maybe a little yep. bit on his previous at bat and hurt it even more as he slid back into third. He had the huge home run in the 11th inning that left the entire stadium. That was absolutely <laughs> awesome. I don't know how he took that 2 2 pitch. That was about six and a half millimeters. Off of right. the plate, it was off the plate, but not, but but only by millimeters. I don't know how he had the discipline to take that pitch, and then went yard on the very next pitch, or a couple of pitches later, actually, I think, completely out of the stadium to give the Cowboys a lead. Colin Brigham went back to back with him. The next thing you know, it is ten to one, and the Cowboys had pulled out a can of whoop ass. So you yeah. gotta you gotta really be worried about Tyler Wolford and how his health comes along, especially because. You don't have Aiden Miola, where well, you don't know if you're going to. The hammy problem. So if you don't have Aiden Miola or Tyler Wolford, now you're talking about putting in guys like Kyler Proctor, who, yeah. by the way, is an absolute stud. Yeah. We know, Coach, coming from Silo, we've seen this guy play many, many different times. He had 417 in high school, two-time Oklahoma Player of the Year. He also was one of the best pitchers in the state of Oklahoma. We've seen this guy. We know how good he is. Having right. said that, he's still a true freshman. You'd still like to have Tyler Wolford and Aiden Miola available to you. So, got to worry about Tyler Wolford. Got to enjoy the way he's been playing. Yeah, all, all I need to know about Kyler Proctor and those type of guys is anytime that you say – OSU baseball and schools like Roth or Silo or Rattan or, or uh, Leedy or Taloga. Anytime you're, talking about, if, anytime you're talking about small school baseball in Oklahoma, um, those guys fit very well at OSU. And plug him in is all I got to say, you know, when they have those kind of names in front of them. So, um, you know, and, and uh, Colin Ritchie not being too far from yeah. that area also. So, but yeah, you know, and, and watching Tyler Wolf, I you don't know they know. played on tournament teams together. They have. Absolutely. To, yeah. yeah, they're not strangers. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they're not strangers. Probably one of them got recruited because somebody yeah. was there watching the other one. He's like, who's this guy? You know, and so. Um, anyway, <clears throat> you know, proximity is a big thing when you're talking about, you know, it's not just your social life and and post academics where the people that you closely relate to is going to de- determine your future success. That happens in high school also. So um, but yeah, watching Tyler Wolf, you know, I don't know that anybody when they square the ball up, I don't know that anybody hits it harder than Tyler Wolfert, uh, maybe Schubert. You know, but watching Tyler Wolford hit the baseball, and and generally speaking, it's he's hitting rockets up the middle. Yeah. You know, that's about waist high for the shortstop, but nobody can get to it. I mean, when you hit the ball, it's kind of like, if you'll remember, we were playing, and I won't mention their name, but we were playing an opponent when we were coaching together, and there was a ball that was hit between – the kid's name was JT Real Muto. Yeah, okay. it went through the pitcher's legs, and it was continuing to rise when it went over the center field fence. Correct. The ball, the, he hit the ball so hard that it went between the pitcher's legs 
and it was still rising when it left center field wall, you know? <laughs> and so, and, and, you know, and when you're playing Carl Albert and you're that close to Tinker field and, you know, we made the joke that I think they're scrambling the jets right now to figure <laughs> out what's flying around. AWACS was picking up that baseball. You know what I mean? And so Tyler Wolf reminds me a lot of that. When he squares the baseball up, it looks different. It you does. Know? Um, and it's got a knuckleball look to it, doesn't it? Yeah, he's hitting a ball that's waist or chest high uh, to the shortstop, and the center fielder still got a chance to catch it. You know yeah. what I mean? And so he hits that ball out of the ballpark. And does it does it swing not remind you a little bit of Mike Piazza? It does. You know, it absolutely you know? does. It one hundred percent does. And he just. I mean, he just murders the baseball when he squares it up. So, yeah, that's a hope he gets back healthy and, and also Miola. But, yeah, watching watching those guys. And then Schubert hits one that's – I don't I didn't even see it on the screen actually land. That left the whole yeah. complex. So, yeah, those guys, uh, when they score the baseball up and they're hitting it well, then, you know, and obviously we need those guys in lineup. But, like you said, it's good to – you know, we've talked about that, having 10, 12 guys that you can count on and plug and proctor in. And, and his first at-bat, he gets a – um, gets a hit and and so yeah um, but you know it's hard to say that you don't miss guys like Wolford and Miola when they're out of the lineup because you do so 100%. obviously hopefully hopefully they get healthy and get back in the lineup before too long. Lane Forsyth I talk about him all the time coach he had another couple of hits where it's like two strikes and the guy throws a nasty slider and he just shortens his stroke up and just pokes it into right field and gets a two out RBI with two strikes just with a perfect approach of just trying to put the ball in play, trying to do what, hey, I call it all the, the baseball its. I mean, Lane Forsyth, whatever the its are in baseball, all the its that you need to do, it just seems like he does all those. I love this guy. Yeah, and stuff that doesn't show up in the stats, right? Things that <clears> – <throat> excuse me, things that don't show up in the scorebook. Yeah, it, it's a hit. It shows up at a hit, but it doesn't show up what kind of hit, right? And just punching that thing, you know – digging in at the plate and punching that thing in the opposite field um, and continuing a rally or starting a rally or getting a guy on base or whatever the case is and trying to get a timely hit and and shooting it to the right side and and not being afraid of um, with less than two outs and runners in scoring position of, of moving runners or, you know, not trying to do anything fancy. He's not out there about – he's about out there about making the right play, right, and, and doing his job at the plate based on the circumstance and the situation at hand. And so – um, there's a lot of those pauses. You know, we talk a lot about the strikeouts and the inability to score runs at times and not getting the timely hits, but there's a lot of those positive things that are happening on a consistent basis with, you know, being able to put Earhart in any part of the lineup like we've discussed a while ago and Lane Foresight just digging in and getting the job done and not afraid to hit a ground ball between short and third or, or punch one to the right side with two outs. So um, there's a lot of those pauses that are going on with the offensive side. It doesn't really show up in a one nothing. Um, doesn't really show up in a, in a stat line, so to speak, but those things are huge. You know, we talk about how big and glaring errors are in a one to nothing ball game or a two to one ball game. It's the same thing on the offensive side, right? How big and glaring those type of at bats are in a close ball game as well. Mm -hmm. So um, you can't. And those are things that not everybody's capable of doing. I mean, you can you can practice it and practice it and practice it, and you can preach it. Not everybody has the ability to go up there and shorten up and just punch it to the opposite field and get a base hit. You know, that's that's difficult. That's a difficult thing in baseball. It's already the most difficult thing in baseball when you're talking about taking a round object and hitting another round object and trying to do that squarely, right? Mm -hmm. It's hard enough to do that when you don't have two strikes on it. It's hard enough to do that if you know what pitch is coming. Right. Um, and so um, it's a huge testament to what it does for the lineup and what it does for the team when you've got guys like Lane Forsyth that is willing to go up there and and do the dirty work, so to speak, um, to punch the ball the other way and, and hit a hit a three hopper through the right side of the infield or or whatever the case is. So yeah, that that to me, and I know it is for you too as, as former baseball coaches and baseball guys, but that's just as impressive of somebody that hits one out of the ballpark, you know. Yeah, it takes a lot of skill to do that. And also I think whenever you're a teammate of somebody who does that and you know they don't give a rat's ass about their their batting average, they don't care about their OPS, they don't care about you know, they don't care about any of that. What they care about is did what I just did for this team, what I just did, does that actually advance our cause to winning this game? That's yeah. the only thing they care about. And I can tell you, as a teammate and as a coach, you really, you really come to appreciate those guys. 
Yeah, absolutely. And you can't have enough of them. Mm-mm. You know, you can't have enough of them to on your uh, baseball team. And we've talked about that, you know, at length of, you know, having guys in the middle of your, of your lineup like, you know, the Brighamans and the Schuberts and Miola and Colin Ritchie and Wolford. those type of guys that you can count on to hit power. And when you got four or five guys like that, you don't need any more power guys. You, yeah. need, a, you need a lot of Lane Forsyth, a lot of Zach Earhart's. Jackson uh, Kroll. Jackson Crolls, you need those type of guys in your lineup on a consi- on a daily basis um, because you've got the power guys in the middle, right? And we need the guys um, like we have. And I think that's, you know, um, what you saw this weekend and, and, and how close OSU was being 3-0 and in that series and also that close to being 0-3 in the series. And a lot of that is because of, you know, the, the contributions that, you know, our top and bottom part of the lineup is having when the middle part of our lineup is struggling. And um, the Lane Forsyths and the Jackson Crolls and the Zach Earhart's going up there and getting base hits and you know getting into a comfortable role in the lineup where they're they feel comfortable doing that. Now I say that, but you know, and then also we just talked about how Zach Earhart at times has to be the four hole. So, but yeah, having the guys that can get on base and move runners for the guys that drive in runs um, is huge. We're talking about the pitching, man. It, when you have a guy like Sam Garcia, hey, he throws it 90, 91, yeah. which to you and I, that sounds very fast because 90, 91 when we played was. The radar guns are different now. It's about five to six, maybe sometimes up to seven miles an hour hotter than they were when we played. I get that because they measured out of the hand instead of when it's crossing the plate now. But 90, 91 in today's day and age, that's not overly high as far as velo goes. But, man, when you have a guy that can go out and walk nobody on a Friday mm-hmm. night, right, to start your seat, to start your series off and then strike out as many as he did, he's able to locate his fastball to the top of the zone, the outer part of the zone, the lower part of the zone, and then he throws that thing that sweeps to the back foot of right-handers and sweeps away from lefties. Can't say enough about how good Sam Garcia went. He went seven innings on Friday night, 11 strikeouts. I mentioned that. 11 strikeouts, Coach, that's very impressive. Not nearly as impressive as the zero walks was. So you're able to have the swing and miss without, you know, having to go outside the zone to do it. He just doesn't get free baseball. He locates, and he's given up just one earned run in his last 14 innings, all in conference play. Can't say enough about the Friday night starter, Sam Garcia, the transfer from High Point. Yeah, so I'm going to do a little comparison for you. I, I've I've thought about this over the last week and a half or so, maybe the last couple podcasts, and I wasn't brave enough to <clears throat> actually do it. But after this weekend, I am. Um, this this current pitching staff because we've talked about how good this pitching staff is, right? Yeah. Not just you know you've got three quality starters on on the weekend, and they just keep rolling guys out of the bullpen, right? <laughs> it's like it's yeah. like OSU's got more guys coming out of the bullpen than a prison rodeo, you know. And it's just it, it, you know you talk about you're coming out um, of the bullpen against Wichita State and O'Toole getting more confidence with more innings after being out for several weeks, and all the other names we mentioned with you know Bogus and. Grant. Uh, Reed and and um, uh, Molsky and all those guys that Blake and all those guys that are coming out of the bullpen. It's just incredible watching the stuff that they're able to do and, and the quality of pitchers and the quality of arms that we're putting on the mound. So right now, as of right now, OSU's pitching staff has a 3.61 ERA mm-hmm. right through this weekend. And the team I'm going to compare them to um, – end up having a 3.21 ERA. That, by the way, that's the eighth best in the United States, ERA-wise. And so I I say that because whether you're talking about pitching or offense, okay, doing this comparison um, is going to be kind of enlightening. And I say this because when you look at RPI and you look at strengths of schedule and and those type of things, and OSU being top 30 RPI going into that week, I think there was actually like 24 RPI going into that weekend with the strength of schedule at 13. And you can look at all those different things from from different standpoints. But the way I look at it is when you're looking at statistics and looking at ERAs and batting averages as a team and those type of things, and and you're saying, okay, who who can we compare this team to that we've seen before that – maybe might give us some insight on whether they're trending up or trending down or whatever the case is. It's important to understand RPI and strength of schedule because it's not just, you know, um, 
teams that were going out and playing that, you know, are sub 500 or, or, you know, and that sort of thing. So they're, they're making these advances and they're producing against quality opponents week in and week out and and in the midweek. And so OSU right now has a 3.61, right? ERA. And the team that I'm going to compare them to had a 3.21 at the end of the year. The batting average for our offense right now is 285. That same team that I'm comparing them to ended with a 263, right? Right now, we are striking out 2.12 times per game. The team I'm comparing them to had a 1.96, so relatively the same. Um, the team I'm comparing them to is the 2016 team that went to the yeah. College World Series. You know, and, and when we're talking about guys like Garcia and Holiday and Gabe Davis and Molsky and Dominic Reed and all those names that we've mentioned, okay, they're producing at the same level as guys with the name of Thomas Hatch and Tyler Buffett and Trey Cobb and Jensen Elliott and Corson Teal and on down the list. And this team, this pitching staff, okay, reminds me a lot of that 2016 team. Mm -hmm. Now, it may completely fall off and make me look like an idiot <laughs> moving forward. But I'm going to blame you if it does, by the way, for the yeah, chance. absolutely. <laughs> but, uh, um, well, get, get in line. There's a long line of people that are trying to blame me. <laughs> you know that. So, um, but uh. it just, you know, we talk, in, we talk week in and week out about how this pitching staff, with maybe the exception of the Dallas Baptist game early in the year, um, has – given OSU an opportunity to win games. They've given OSU an opportunity to win a one to nothing game or a two to one game. And we won, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, in that College World Series in 2016, we won two games one to nothing. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I've I've kind of looked at that, but you know, when you start throwing names around like Hatch and Buffett and Cobb and Jensen Elliott, those type of guys, you go, you gotta be careful in making those comparisons. Um but this this pitching staff has it. I mean, this pitching staff has the arms to compare and relate to that type of team. And if OSU can get consistent, and I've said it over and over and over again, you know, I think this team has the ability to get hot in the middle or late middle to the end to make some noise going into the playoffs. They may not be a team that's going to host a regional or anything like that. Um, but they I might be, that, though. But they might. Easily could you be. Know, and if they get hot enough. And But when you've got arms like OSU does right now, and you've got arms that are producing at the level that those guys in 2016 were. Um, I don't know how anybody couldn't be excited about um, the the second half of, of this season. So, yeah, just incredible to watch, whether it's Garcia, like you're talking about, who, you know, maybe coming off the field every now and again, he'll pump a fist. But, I mean, he's a guy that, you know, against – um, last weekend or the previous series, he walked, he gets the base low with no outs and then strikes out the side to, yeah. you know, and so it's just, um, it's impressive to watch. Um, and probably more than anything, it's really impressive to watch those guys struggle and then watch Rob Walton take 17 minutes to walk out to the mound. And, um, that and as soon as he leaves the mound, the whole thing changes. Yeah, right? right. I mean, whatever he's telling them, you know, and it's almost like Rob Walton takes so long to get to the mound that the guys are like, "Holy crap! I don't know what's coming right here." But whatever it is, whatever's coming is working. And yeah, so, right. Um, it's it's really it's really you good. know what's working is he has the kind of pitchers I think he works with the best. The guys that move the ball, the guys that locate, the guys that rely on movement. That was the kind of pitcher he was, you know. And I yeah. think it just it's gelling be him, between him and a guy like like Brian Holiday, because also the mentalities, man. Rob Walton doesn't play, man. That's one of the most competitive. If you've ever yeah. been around him, he is one of the right. most competitive human beings of all time. And he's dealing with pitchers in his staff like Brian Holiday, Sam Garcia, that are equally as competitive, that have a similar type of mix that he had. So I just think it's gelling really well. Yeah, and I, and I, can, and I can imagine the conversation going something like this. We don't expect you to miss the bat. We just want you to miss the barrel, you yes, know. And it's, it's the whole it's the whole pitch to contact theory, right? And it's the whole pitch pitch to contact conversation of those guys are really good. They they the ball moves all over the place with those pitchers. We it stays in the zone, goes, but stays in the zone. You yeah. know, it may start outside the zone and work its way back in, or it may start in the inner half and work the outer half. And those guys are so good at at command and control and pitch selections and those type of things that you know they don't have to miss the bat. You know, they just have to miss the barrel. And, and I think, you know, at times um, guys get ramped up or, you know, they want to go out there and, and strike everybody out and that sort of thing. And then they get calmed down and realize, you know, and, and what it produces is you actually start missing more bats when you're just trying to miss the barrel. And so um, anyway, that's that's what um, I've been thinking about for the last 
couple of podcasts and brave enough to actually start talking about it now that we've been through three Big 12 series and and this pitching staff just continues to look incredible um, from start to finish and the guys coming out of the bullpen and and um, guys that you even forget about that you hadn't had in the bullpen like so um, yeah very impressive um, what the pitching staff continues to do on a on a day in and day out basis. So when you saw that Proctor was from Silo, you were sold right then and there. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't I, need Robbie more. Rainwater did not need any more proof. <laughs> no, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't need to hear anything else. I don't care what I don't care what his stats were in high school or high, Side how, unseen. High, 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 how, how highly recruited he was coming out of high school. So, this kid is from Silo. Okay, you can just shut it off right there. I don't need to know anything else. Right? Nothing else. You know, and and you know, <laughs> me growing up and, and playing baseball in the mid nineties, and you know, in in the area of, you know, I'm, I'm originally from Prague, and so we were always playing Dale and Latta and Ryan and Herman, of, you know, and and Stroud and Chandler and and those type of guys, and and we'd go down to the Rattan tournament with the with the Clay brothers down there, the Clay cousins. It seemed like there was a thousand of them, you know. It was like everybody that came through the lineup his last name was Clay, and you just, you know, and sometimes I'd be playing third base or left field. It, it didn't matter. I could I couldn't back up far enough when they came to play. But anyway, they um, those guys are just, you know, and Silo's coach. So I, I say all that to say my. My high school baseball coach was an Asher boy, you know, yeah. and, and he um, uh, he pitched collegiately for the team down south, and then he was roommates with Todd Zeal and the minors and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, um, oh, are you talking about Dallas Baptist? Uh, no, no, no. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so <clears throat> anyway, his high school coach obviously was Merle Bowen, and yeah. you know, Silo's coach oh, for the Merle. last forty years or whatever was Merle Bowen, Bowen's brother, Billy Jacker. So any and um, so they. That's a great baseball family and, and uh, great baseball traditions and all those small schools, those fall baseball schools, man, it, it's fun to go watch them and, and they're, t- they're taught the right way. It's still a lot old school there and mm-hmm. they play the small ball and the long ball and, and they play baseball the right way. So, you know, the knowledge of the game of those guys coming out of those small schools that have played, you know, 40, 50, 60 games before spring ever rolls around, not to mention what they've done in the summer uh, just by playing fall baseball. Um, you know, those guys are well equipped and have always done well at OSU. Football, what the hell is that, right? Yeah, yeah I mean, they, who wants to do all that? Who wants to do all that? No. Hey, by the way, Max Hewitt, I had a chance to interview him for my Dodgers Daily site. Get a chance to communicate with him quite a bit. I, you know, not not that much, but, but enough. I shoot him a text, he'll shoot me back, do the courtesy to do that kind of thing. He was with the Dodgers for three or four years, so got to cover him there. Really cool. He's maybe my favorite Oklahoma State baseball player of all time and that's saying a lot because yeah. i mean i grew up in the 80s when you talk about a guy that is i have i have respect for i mean just wow just watching him was a pure joy max you had said you mentioned it just a minute ago hey there is no such thing as old school there's no such thing as new school in baseball there are certain things that's just the right school yeah. you know bunting when you're supposed to bunt hitting the ball to right field with two strikes to get a base hit right. to score a run that's not old school that's not new school what brian holiday's doing moving the ball locating missing barrels and not worried about striking guys out and going long distances above 100 pitches that's not old school that's not new school in my opinion that's just the right school this is baseball you yeah. know, and it's, you know, we used to talk to kids about that a lot when I was coach. I talked to my son, you know, about a lot of those things is it doesn't, it doesn't matter who you're playing, you know, what, what you're doing on a daily basis when you cross that white line and you step on the diamond is we're going to, we're going to go out and play baseball. And there just so happens to be a, another group of guys in a different uniform that are here to do the same thing. Yeah. And we're going to find out today who's better at playing the game of baseball, right? But when you're supposed to bunt and and hit the ball to the right side when you're supposed to hit the ball to the right side. Look for pitches. If you got runners on if you've got a runner on third and it's a tight ball game and, and you need an insurance run and you come and you come to the plate and that runner's on third base, look for something up in the zone that you can get in the out, outfield and hit a sacrifice fly. Yeah. Right? Or look for something on the outer half that maybe we may be taking early on in the ball game to get pitch counts up or get a better pitch. When you're in a, in, when you're in the right situation and they throw you a fastball on the outside part of the plate and you got a runner on third base with less than two outs swing at it and hit it to the right side and score mm-hmm. a run you know and so that's those are the things you know going back to the air hearts and the jackson crolls and and the lane four sites and the things that they're really good at and and i've and i've talked about you know a lot about osu being more aggressive but that's that's the things i'm talking about yeah, right sure. being, being more aggressive doesn't mean that we're trying to hit runs 
being more aggressive means that if we're looking for a timely hit and we need to move runners right here or we need to get a ball ground ball to the right side with a runner on third base, if they throw you a first pitch fastball on the outside part of the plate, hit it. You mm-hmm. know, and do with it what you're supposed to do with it. Hit it to the right side. Don't try and pull it. So, um, yeah, uh, going back to what you're saying about, you know, talking to Max Hewitt is that that's exactly right. It's, you know, I use the term old school and, and, and that sort of thing just because. But that is that is how baseball is supposed to be played. And you're not going out there and you're not playing West Virginia. You're not playing um, Wichita State. You're going out there and you're playing the game of baseball. And we're going to see if we're better at playing the game of baseball than the other team that's on the field. And so, um, and right now, I think OSU is trending in that direction. And, they're, and and if they can get more consistent in their in their lineup, and that thing shuffles, I'm, I'll give up on trying to figure out what the lineup's going to be yeah. from time to time. And you know, and I know, you know, the the pitcher has a lot to do with that. One of the things that we haven't talked about in the lineup is how the weather plays into what that lineup mm-hmm. looks like, right? And and if the wind's blowing in hard like it was against Wichita State, and and it's not the weather doesn't favor the long ball you know maybe you are putting in um jackson kroll or, or somebody like that as opposed to another power hitter to get more base runners as opposed to playing the long ball so um you know there's a lot of different things that plays in that that maybe you don't see on tv but um you know we we also talked last week about how you're going to get schubert and kroll in the lineup at the same time and i think you're you saw that this weekend mm-hmm. yeah. um so anyway yeah I think OSU, again, I, I, you know, in making that comparison to the 2016 pitching staff, which is, you know, a, a very honorable comparison, if you ask me, um, I think if they're trending the right way and, and if we can get Wolfert and, and Miola healthy again and, and they're not out too long, then I think you're fixing to see what um, – what um, they're capable of doing when they get hot consistently throughout the lineup as this pitching staff continues to throw like they've been throwing. Brian Holiday, you mentioned the pitching staff, went over 100 pitches again. Again. He gave up just one earned run on Saturday. He's gone at least six, at least six innings in every outing this year. Yeah. Eight or more. He's gone eight or more innings four times this year, and he's allowed just three earned runs in his last 25 innings. That dude's just a pit bull. And I tell you, Tommy Molsky, man, as the chief mentioned, he has some misfire to him. Hey, he loses the zone from time to time. But that's pretty typical of a guy his age. If you go watch professional baseball, go watch a single-A game, a high-A game, they're filled full of guys like Tommy Molsky that are pumping it in there 95-96. And one inning you're going, damn, he's going to be in the major leagues in three weeks. And then the next inning you're going, okay, where'd the strike zone go? The, the pros are filled full of those guys. Yeah. It, this guy has maybe the most professional-ready mix right now uh, of anybody I've seen so far as far as coming out in relief this year. Yeah, I mentioned it last podcast. He's probably my favorite pitcher, and 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 you know how much I've talked about Brian Holiday and, and how impressive he's been. But man, Molsky just, um, and I don't know. Maybe it's because you get just a short glimpse of him, you know, one or two times a weekend that you know makes you desire more and see see yeah, more right. of him, you know. And it's you know Brian Brian Holiday is kind of getting to the point where you know if he gives up a couple of runs, you're like is. You know, is he getting dead arm or is yeah? He, what's hell's going on here? What, what, what's happening here? I mean, he just, you know, he he just gave, you know, because early in that game on um, Saturday, they squared him up a couple of times. You know, early on in the game, they squared him up a couple of times. Now they didn't get very many hits, but they were hitting hard fly balls and and that sort of thing. You start and you start to think, okay, this kid's thrown over a hundred pitches last, you know, three times. Is is he starting to get a little dead arm? Do we need to back him up? And then that conversation ends really quickly. You oh, know. Yeah. But, and, and and Molsky is just the kind of guy that I, I want to see Molsky throw as much as I want to see Brian Holiday throw and as much as I want to see Garcia throw and those type of guys. So, um, yeah, just impressive. Like I said uh, last podcast, he's my favorite guy to watch in, and him and Holiday. And it's it's a, it's 1A and 1B for me. But, um, yeah, just just very impressive what he does with the baseball and, and um, his mentality of, you know, I think I mentioned this on one other podcast. If he's the type of guy that throws it and, and by the time it's hit the catcher's bit, He's asking for it back because he's ready to throw it again. So, um, you know, I don't think I don't think that uh, that pitch deal that they use that wrist man. I don't think it can give the pitch fast enough for him. So, just tell me what to throw and I'm throwing it. And so, um, very impressive to watch. And and you know his command his command is in my opinion is getting a lot better. You know, he like you said he loses it time to time, but early on the season he was a forty or fifty. Yeah pitch guy max and and get him out and now you know i think you can stretch him to 65 70 pitches and and he'd be okay so um yeah he's very impressive and you know you can go on and on and on about the names that are in that bullpen you know kiesel 
You know, going yeah. back to the Wichita State game, that's a guy. When, when I watched that Wichita State I, I th- game, I thought two things: blah, right? Yeah, and, and it's like that atmosphere. Yeah, the atmosphere, and and it's not the same series as it used to be against Wichita State, and and all that kind of stuff. But the second thing I noticed was here's a guy that's competing to get his weekend job back. Yeah, no doubt. You know, here's a guy that here's a guy that, and I think that's one of the things that the coaching staff, Coach Holiday, Coach Walton, those guys, I think that is one of the things that they do very, very well. And is that they create individual competitions inside of a team concept. They do. Right. And they're really good at that and making sure that that doesn't become a cancer, doesn't become something that festers, doesn't become a locker room problem or, or um, that sort of thing. They complete, they can, they create those individual cons, uh, competitions inside that team concept, which only makes your pitching staff better, only makes your batting lineup better, makes you better defensively. Um, and makes so you tougher. makes you tougher mentally. You know, they all, they're all tough physically, right? They yeah, all got right. physical gifts, but do you have it right up here? And so that's what, that's what coming out of the Wichita State game that I noticed was how Kiesel looked like to me that he was going out there and competing to get his weekend job back, you know, and um, you don't ever want guys going out and, and pitching like a Gabe Davis. You don't want him going out pitching that I can't mess up or I'm going to get replaced. Um but on the other side of that, you want every kid, no matter what inning they're pitched in, whether it's midweek um, and it's a close ball game or midweek and it's a blowout or or it's a weekend series, at every pitch that they throw and every inning that they throw, that they're competing to move up in that depth chart on the uh, in the on the pitching staff. So that's what I noticed from Kiesel and and um, and you know we can give multiple examples of how that transpires over uh, the course of a season and throughout the this this um, ball club. But um, yeah, the the pitching staff I can't say enough about it. You know of of what they have been able to accomplish and keeping OSU in ball games and being able to win close ball games, whether um, you know it's a one nothing ball game or a two to one ball game or even you know um, that turns into a ten in one ball game or whatever, mm-hmm. stay, keep them in the game long enough for, you know, hits are contagious. We talk about yep. that a lot, right? Batting is contagious. You get a couple of guys that string together a couple of hits, and all of a sudden that becomes Especially contagious. Especially this group because they're tight-knit. They are, and, and I think you saw that in the Saturday game, you know. And so, um, anyway, being able to keep us in every ball game until we can string together some hits and get some timely hits to break it open um, has been very impressive to watch. We'll have another podcast to talk about the last Bedlam series ever in Stillwater later on in the week. So looking forward to that. But, Coach, hey, another great podcast, another great job. Thank you so much for joining. Absolutely. I want to thank everybody else for tuning in and say, go Cowboys, go Pokes. Go Pokes.